Well, welcome back. I'm Kevin O'Keefe. For this issue today, teens using technology to improve the world. When 14-year-old Ri Song first learned about lentil fungus, she knew it was a big problem in her province. You see, Saskatchewan is one of the largest producers of lentils in the world. A bad bout of fungus means the whole crop and a farmer's livelihood can be completely wiped out. So Ri decided to do something about it. And she's Skyping us from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, to explain her discovery. Welcome to the show, Ri. Thank you. I want to start off with, can you sort of explain exactly what lentil fungus is? Well, the fungus that I studied was called Colletotrichum truncatum. And it initially starts by producing lesions on the leaves. And these lesions eventually spread all over the entire plant, effectively killing the plant. And when did you first get interested in science and technology? Is this something you've always been a passion of yours? Um, well, I think that a person's interests and preferences are mainly determined by the environment they grow up in, um, the media and literature they're exposed to. And as a young child, I read tons of books, and I guess this must have started my curiosity and need to know the science behind the things around me. And science also has a huge impact on, you know, many aspects of our everyday lives. And I like to keep updated about things like current events. So I guess wanting to understand the science behind these events also developed. And tell me a bit about your interest in lentil fungus. Where did that come from? Well, I'm from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, and Saskatchewan is one of the world's top areas for lentil production. But the fungus called Hotchicum truncatum poses a huge problem for producers, mainly because it causes extremely high yield loss. And of course, this is a crucial problem for lentil production. So what I wanted to do was build a foundational knowledge base about the fungus in hopes that this could be used in developing a resistant lentil cultivar. And such a cultivar would mean not only higher yields for producers and benefits for Canada's economy, but also ensures the health of a large part of the world's population that relies on lentils as an important source of protein. So how did you decide that this was going to be something that you were going to work on? I understand it had something to do with the BioTalent Challenge. Can you tell me what that is? Yeah, actually, this year is my third year of participating in the BioTalent Challenge. Um, in previous years, I'd also worked on plant molecular biology. And I was first introduced to this program in grade seven by a science teacher who suggested it to the entire class. And I thought that, you know, it was an exciting opportunity to be able to get out that hands-on in the lab um, research experience that someone normally wouldn't have gotten in a normal school setting. And how old were you at the time? I think I was 12. Yeah, and this 12. is something that interested you, working in a lab? Yeah, I mean... You see, you see lab work on TV and movies. I guess, like, I mean, I guess it sort of sensationalizes the whole thing. But yeah, it was definitely, I guess, an interest of mine, and it was definitely sounded really exciting for me, especially at that time. And you never thought, gee, I'm just 12 years old. What can I discover? I mean, was that was your age? Did you think an advantage or disadvantage to you then? Um. Well, I mean, I guess like your age, I guess it can be like both a disadvantage and an advantage. Um, when you start getting, you know, this early experience, especially when you're young and you have this experience, this knowledge as, I guess, a foundational base for hands-on experience for, I guess, later in life if you want to pursue that career. But, I mean, I guess a disadvantage would be, I guess, people don't think that you're able to make a meaningful contribution. However, I was fortunate enough to be able to work with so many researchers who supported me and motivated me and encouraged me that I didn't really find this to be a problem. Tell me a bit more about that. You had someone that helped you out, that mentored you in this process? Yeah. My mentor this year was Dr. Sabina Benitza, and she works at the University of Saskatchewan Crop Development Center. And I, I'm just so grateful to her for being so generous and kind with her time and patience. Um, I don't think that many people realize just how demanding it is to commit to having a young student in your lab that might not have any knowledge or experience in your field and still have to, you know, perform all the other functions that a researcher has to do. So I'm just extremely grateful to her 
because she welcomed me into her lab and she patiently answered all of my questions. Rekin, tell me a bit about your experiment. How did you actually find that specific marker, that genome you're talking about? Okay, well, these molecular markers um, are based on the genetic level, meaning that you'll have to, it's based on the DNA of the samples themselves. So first you would start with inoculating or infecting these funguses, these fungi, on several lentil plants. And once you've reached that stage, you would then extract the DNA from these plants and, I guess, amplify them through a process known as PCR. And what PCR does is it produces many, many copies of the DNA strand so that it's large enough for you to be able to visualize. Now, naturally, the next step is to visualize the DNA. And this is done through an agarose gel or, in some cases, another type of gel created using another type of substance. Um, basically, the principle of an agarose gel is that it works as a filter, and um, I guess smaller pieces of DNA are able to pass through easier, and larger pieces of DNA are stuck at the top of the gel, so you get a differentiation of your DNA strands based on their size. And, Re, you're sure you're 14 years old? Yeah. <laughs> Where did you learn all this? This isn't something a typical 14-year-old would know. Well, I mean, that I have to say is because of my mentor. Um, over the past three years, I've been lucky enough to have dedicated mentors who have, you know, been generous with their time and been patient enough to allow me into their labs and allow me to an uh, ask as many questions as I'd like. So I guess that's where I can attribute my knowledge from. And you, the, you actually went to the Bio Talent Challenge competition in Ottawa? Yep. What was that experience like? Well, I mean, it was a really great experience because what the National Bio Talent Challenge competition does is it brings young, bright young scientists from across Canada who are all so enthusiastic about using science as a method of, I guess, helping humanity, um, helping the environment, bettering our planet. And I guess this really shows in their projects. And it was just really a great experience for me to be there with them and a bunch of other researchers because um, we were actually at the NRC headquarters in Ottawa and we had a public viewing time where NRC researchers were allowed to, I guess, view our projects and ask us questions and hold discussions. And I found that just to be really interesting and inspiring and motivating for me because my project actually, I don't know, has impact even among the scientific community. And you won, correct? Your project won. Yeah, um, I did win. <laughs> what yeah. was that experience like, winning? Well, well, the winners were announced at an award ceremony a day after the competition. And frankly, when I heard my name being called, I was just really shocked because, <laughs> as I said before, you know, all these bright young people from across Canada with amazing projects. And when I came into this competition, I really didn't think that, I really didn't expect to win. I didn't come in with the expectation of winning. I simply wanted to present my project to the best of my ability, to represent the time and effort my mentor and I had put into the project. Um, now, what's the future of your project? You discovered this genetic marker. What happens now? Well, actually, um, we still haven't found a suitable marker for distinguishing these two races. But, I mean, that, that's, that's in the works. So basically you're one step closer to doing that now? Essentially, yes. And do you have a timeline for that? Well, I mean, the thing with science is that it's not instantaneous. It's a gradual process. And you might start out with a question, develop some rough procedures and protocols, and along the way, you'll definitely have to troubleshoot or adjust your protocol. And that requires, you know, many, many repetitions of maybe one specific part to see what went wrong. Once you get past that stage, you can actually start running through your experiment, um, analyzing results and drawing conclusion. But the reality of science is that, you know, despite countless years of experimentation, you might not have a significant result. And I guess that's, that's just life. 
Well, Ree, I suspect if anyone is going to have a significant result, it will be you. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time today. I appreciate it, and good luck with your project. Thank you. No problem. Well, when we return, one teen's dream to help children in hospitals using his eye touch. That's next.